Come on down to the Tiki Lounge A little grass shack with a bamboo bar It could be any island Maybe not too far Exotic drinks we'd like you to try Dance away the night At the Tiki Lounge Welcome to Tiki Lounge. I'm Merle Fankhauser, and on this show, we're doing an interview with Peter Lewis of Moby Grape, and I've got Peter with me right now. Glad to have you on the show today. Well, I'm glad to be here. Yes, it yeah. is good to still be here, isn't it? It feels good to be here. <laughs> yeah. So when did Moby Grape first get formed? Well, I think the story started when... Uh, first guy that played drums for the Jefferson Airplane got fired, and his name was Skip Spence. And he didn't uh, leave the scene. He went uh, and sort of was a protege of our, the manager that still managed the Jefferson Airplane at that time. And when I uh, was in L.A., at the same time, I was playing in a band in L.A. with Bob Mosley, Joel Scott Hill, and a, a drummer. And the drummer had met Matthew Cates, the, the manager of the, the airplane, when he came to find another drummer to replace Skip for the Jefferson Airplane, you know. So, this he was back now, and he wanted to uh, get a band for Skip, and so somehow the, we were practicing, and I looked at a guy who was leaning in the corner, dark-haired guy with a goatee, and kind of s twisting his goatee and looking at us, you know. And I, uh, so I didn't think much of it. Next day I got a call from the drummer said, you know, Matthew really likes us. And I said, uh, who's Matthew? And he <laughs> said, the guy, you remember that guy last, you know, with the beard? And I said, yeah. He said, well, he wants to meet in his apartment on Hollywood Boulevard. So we all went up there and talked to him. And he had a Jefferson Airplane album that he showed us. And then he talked about going to San Francisco. And I think um, everybody was kind of on the fence about it. But we talked, and later Joel just decided not to do it. And Bob Mosley and I and the drummer went and met Skip, and we got along. And then they didn't like the drummer. The drummer left. Bob called two friends of his that he'd played with in a band called the Frantics up there. They showed up, and we had a session one night. And it's like when you find the right people and you... Everything play, clicks. Everything clicks, you know. So, so where did Johnny Barbada come in the scene? Well, Johnny, Johnny was uh, uh, the drummer for Joel Scott Hill right. that, that, that went and joined the Turtles, and then Joel got my drummer to join him, and that's kind of like... But first of all, I met Johnny and Joel. I mean, Johnny and Lee Michaels before I met Joel because they came to see me at my when I was playing in my gig at Gazzari's, and they asked me to sit in for Joel because he wasn't going to be there that Sunday, so I sat in for Joel. That was the first connection I have. So that's why I told you before, if I hadn't met Johnny Barbada, I'd have never gotten Moby Grape. Amazing. Yeah. So again, my original question, what year was it that Moby Grape actually got together as a group? Uh, it was the uh, 66. 66. All right. Yeah, I was living up in the desert then in the Lancaster area, and I'd go down and play gigs on the Sunset Strip with my band Merle and the Exiles. So when did Moby Grape's first album come out? In 67. Yeah. I think it was uh, June of 67. And the title of that album, Peter? Just Moby Grape. Okay, yeah, I remember the album. So then you guys just started playing everywhere probably after that, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, we did. Yeah, we played, you know, like we went on tour with the Mamas and Papas. and But it was at a funny time when, you know, music was changing so quickly in those days that you know, the mamas and papas were huge stars, and then something would happen that was just a little more edgy, and then that would become the more popular thing. Yeah. And and The uh, Doors came along. The Doors came along, or Jimi Hendrix. Yeah, Jimi Hendrix. Right afterwards. For, so, I don't... But I remember about the mamas and papas gig is that it was... 
uh, you know, there was some tension there, and they didn't want to play right after us, so they had the Buckinghams, they put on their bill, but the deal was to play on an equal bill with him, which Clive Davis offered us. And so we just, in faith, so it's great, you know. But And they were bigger stars, but like I say, the thing at that point, you could be a star overnight if you just had something new. Right. You know, that it wasn't like the folk rock anymore. Those days were sort of fading in the days of, you know, the peace and love thing was not popular. It was more like off, off the pigs. And San Francisco represented that rebellious, you know, like more like not the Beatles, but like the Stones approach to life. Exactly. And I started out when I was 17 in a surf band called The Impacts. They had an album on Delphi called Wipeout. And we thought, oh, man, surf music is going to last forever. And then the British invasion happened. And it, like you just said, everything changed. And then they kept changing after that. So you've continued to play all of these years. And now you're living on the Central Coast, and I think that's really neat. And zooming forward to now, you're playing with your daughter. That's right, and here she is. Yes. Beautiful Arwen, come on in. And we're going to go to some Moby Grape songs that Peter brought us, and then Peter and Arwen are going to play live on the Tiki Lounge stage. So, Arwen, when did you start playing guitar and singing and realize that you wanted a career in music? Well, I went after it about six years ago. I always had this, like, really, like, determined um, thought that I was going to be a musician, but I always felt that it was too late, and I didn't pursue it in high school. I kind of played here and there piano, but I never really took it seriously. And then I graduated college, and at that point, I figured I had just as much of a chance finding a job as something else as being a musician. So <laughs> I asked my dad to teach me how to play and sing, and we started recording um, some ideas that I had for songs and that we had worked on together, and a few Moby Grape things as well. And then we sent them over to a producer in New York City named John DiNicola, and he decided he thought it would be a good idea to make an album of me singing Moby Grape songs. Wow, that's a good idea. Idea. And wow, you did all of this in just six years. I mean, I find that amazing. It's taken me uh, 50 years <laughs> to get, you know, the, all the recordings out. And it's just amazing. Well, it's the beginning of a long journey. You know, Having your dad help yeah. <laughs> has, has been a big help. So we're looking forward to uh, seeing you guys and hearing you play today. So we'll show some of the Moby Grape uh, videos, some of the vintage stuff, and then we'll go to the Tiki Lounge stage with Peter and Arwen. Sounds great. Thank you, Meryl. All right. Thank you both for coming on the show today. Thanks You're for welcome. having us. All right. <laughs> one, two, one, two, three. Didn't it rain was an old Bible story set to the contemporary beat of today beautiful example of how religious music has always kept itself youthful by absorbing pop forms. Now, here's a new fusion of music that might be called country rock. Moby Gray from San Francisco is the group that mixes country and western flavor with a rockin' beat, bridging not only the generation gap, but the geography gap.
many rock groups <laughs> with far out names, but none of them can top our next guests, the Moby Grapes.
and but just the same. I'm playing my game, and I guess you'll play at it too. Sorry. 